Thank you. So good evening, everyone. My name is Melissa Woolsey, for those of you that don't know me, and I am the Parent Engagement Coordinator on School Council. It's great to see so many people logged on tonight. Uh, we've got, we're getting close to 60 people, so that's awesome. Uh, we're very lucky this evening to have Meyer Halpert with us. She's a wealth of knowledge, so much experience when it comes to giftedness, twice exceptional learners, and understands the asynchronicity that um, gifted learners have. She has a master's in education from the University of Michigan, and she's also co-authored a book with her husband called The 3D Learner, Transforms Stress to Outrageous Success for Your Child. She has taught thousands of children, lots of success sort stories, um, and uh, I think this all started when she saw that the needs of her own children were not being met. So I know we'll have lots to learn tonight and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, Myra doesn't want this to be an interactive session. So if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And uh, yeah, and I'll pass it on to Myra. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and welcome everybody. Yes, I'm, I'm Mira. I have four now adult kids and actually now dealing with Grandkid and um, with I got into this quite honestly as as a parent. So I've sat where you guys are about being really frustrated about why does my kid know this and can't do that. Um, and I developed what is now called the three D learner program for my then actually eighth grade daughter. But it wasn't like we hadn't you know been dealing with issues from from I'm kindergarten with all of them. So um, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going to use PowerPoint as sort of a as sort of a jump out just to keep me on track with with my attention issues and giftedness. But I really want this to be as interactive as possible. Melissa and I talked a little bit about um, what some of parents might have might have um, brought forth as far as questions about their kids. I'm going to tell you that I'm right off the bat that you're lucky to be able to have a school that's a little, I'm going to say more homogeneous if you can, with kids that are that are gifted, right, Melissa? This is a school for gifted kids, but I think we have everybody from K to 12. Is that correct on that's here? That's correct. Can yes, it is. And yes. give me some indication. So um, there, um, hopefully there's some new things you're going to learn tonight. If there's some things that you're like, oh, I've heard this before. Um, bear with me, but sometimes we have to be able to try and make sure that everybody's on the same on the same page that we're talking the same language. So why wouldn't you put press the blink light? I'm sorry. Was that just um, yeah? Okay. I've just been yeah. That was <laughs> just an interrupt. Okay, so I'm going to start right off the bat with how did you how do you think your child learns best, and then think a little bit about how do you learn. How many of you think you learn like your kids learn? Different? The same? Melissa is shaking her head. I can't see all of the other parents and I don't know if we can change the way this actually looks so that I can get a candle on some of more of the people. But I'm gonna tell you that by and large, um, gifted kids are much more what we call visual most of them are majority now are visual spatial learners and that has to do certainly environmentally now than what I, when i started 100 years ago um with with teaching the gifted it was a very different very different child very different outlook um but by and large kids that are that more visual spatial are much have much more vivid admission uh, imaginations are what i call visual meaning they have pictures in their heads, right? They have this really imagination, but sometimes they aren't actually able to access that to be able to use that to their best abilities to be able to learn. So I went on this adventure, I guess, you know, as an educator teaching lots of different kinds of kids. And then you get the real education when you become a parent. And my oldest child was probably a classically gifted child. Um, I was the director of a preschool at the time that I, and he was a late September. So for those of you that have kids that you're like, oh, I want to be able to push ahead. I don't know that I want to be able to hold them back. Here I was the director of that preschool, having to be able to make that decision for my own child. And I was helping other parents make that decision. And he was physically bigger than some of the other kids. So it wasn't like he was being really small. He was very verbal, 
but very creative, very hands-on. So I did what some other parent, what other, what other parents, I guess I suggested was I sent him to some other, other school to let them make the decision so that I wouldn't have to. So we sent him to a private kindergarten. That was probably the best thing choice I've ever made educationally for all of my kids. It was a very hands-on school it was called preschool of the arts, if you can imagine. So that was a kindergarten program that he would be doing woodworking and he'd be doing art and they'd be acting out words as well as learning to read. And I, he was learning, he, he learned to read by the time he was probably the first month in school. And I remember going, you guys have winters. I was living in Wisconsin at the time and, and pregnant, having to be able to trudge out in four, three, four, five feet of snow to be able to have these kids ex act out what they were learning, what they were reading. And was I think back on that and all the different reading wars that we're going through about how to teach kids to read, I realized that that's probably the best possible thing that we can do for our kids at the very beginning. And then my daughter, had, my daughter who was very verbal, very creative, um, two years younger, but she had a really difficult time reading. And we <laughs> did absolutely everything that we possibly could do. And I... You know, there were there were more interventions than I could shake a stick at. I actually even used had who was asked for help from my older son's second grade teacher, who was this highly gifted teacher who worked with highly gifted kids. If she would be his her teacher, and what was I realized that that mismatch just doesn't work when you actually every kid is very different, and every kid and I wasn't and I will be honest with you, it wasn't until she was much more of an adult that I realized how truly gifted she was but really much more of this visual spatial learner. So I'm gonna spend a little time tonight about talking about the qualities of a visual spatial learner, what that means, but especially in terms of giftedness and then in terms of executive function. So if, those, if, if that works for you, if that's what questions you have, please let me know. But I, so it was when my daughter was, when we had done all these interventions, and when my daughter was in middle school and she was making that um, that transition to high school, we were called to that in a public school. We were called to a meeting and I told my husband to, you know, he needed to clear his, his business schedule to be able to come to that meeting with me that day because I really had felt that there was going to be some contention when we walked in and there were more than a dozen people on the other side of that table. And um, their first, and our daughter was with us and I insisted that she be, this was a meeting about her. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about how making sure that we include our kids in these decisions. But they, you know, very nice to have you, Mr. and Mrs. Halpert, it's really lovely. And we just wanna tell you what a lovely, what a lovely daughter you have. She has a wonderful personality. And then there was this silence, but. She is not college material because her reading comprehension is behind more than four grade levels, and we just don't know what to do. So we think we should exit her from this kind of a program, a college prep, prep program, and have her be in vocational ed. My daughter starts very emotional, had always been emotional, and that to me at the time didn't really click in on any kind of um, any kind of flag. And you see, I have on my list up here emotional intensity. How many, how many of you experience emotional intensity with any of your kids? I don't know if there's a thumbs up in any of this, Melissa, that they can use, but it's kind of, it's a, that, that's one of a, a huge piece for, for giftedness, right? This asynchronous, but definitely highly emotional. And <laughs> yeah, and she, um, my husband turned to her and said, Julie, what is it that you want to be when you grow up? And her answer without batting an eye was, I want to be the teacher I never had. And that was sort of the beginning of, okay. She was like, well, mom, I think in pictures. And that's where I started to be able to learn much more about a visual spatial learner. And I learned it from Dr. Linda Silverman, who is, you know, the world renowned specialist in gifted. Melissa and I had had a chance in the head of school, we had a chance to spend a week together in, in a training this summer with her. But She's someone that's really given me all of this insight for giftedness, for gifted kids about these different abilities that they have. I'm going to go down this list. How many think they have great visualization skills? They process information quickly, but so many have what we're going to, I'm going to get into the difficulties. So 
slower processing speed as assessed on an assessment. On the psychoid assessment, their processing speed can be lower because, as I've had this discussion with Dr. Silverman many times, there is no way of assessing how much these kids are processing, right? That's kind of the big piece. I don't know if this is coming from me. Or so the challenge becomes is that they are processing a lot of information all of the time. They're very big picture learners. They're mastery at building. We sometimes call them Lego learners, Lego builders. And they are seeking patterns and relationships. Out of, obviously, it goes without saying, out of the box thinker and emotion, that emotional intensity. And they're always sort of, um, if they're not that intense, they also really love being able to play games and being able to make up games for that kind of thing. But the other question is, the other side of that piece is, what is your child having difficulty with? And I'm going to have a list. This is, look, this is fairly general. This was from my years of experience of working with these kids. I am going to tell you the end of the story was I ended up developing, because I didn't have a school like you guys have, I ended up developing a program called 3D Learner that I worked with teachers, but I worked, but I developed, and actually with Julie's input, and within the three years, I heard, and started the program actually really with her um, three years later, but her reading comprehension um, went up significantly. And yes, she went on to college, went on to get her master's, and just this last August received her doctorate in gifted in special ed, twice exceptional education. So, and, and I am going to tell you when I said that I didn't know how gifted she was, it really wasn't until Dr. Silverman met her and, you know, we had been zeroing in on the difficulties, not zeroing in on her giftedness. And that changed everything for me and it changed everything for her, but it changed how I look at kids and it changes how, changes how when I work with teachers, let alone the one I'm working with parents about how we look at our kids. So I'm going to look about the, uh, talk about these difficulties a little bit. Um, you know, how many of your kids have struggled with easy material? The biggest answer I think we get from our kids is mm, it's boring. And that is two-sided sometimes because it may be easy. It's also a trigger word for the fact that I'm not sure I know how to do this, but if I say it's boring, it gets a different response from us as parents, right? Um, if reading is a different, do any of you have gifted kids that are having reading difficulties? Is there a show? Is that actually something that is? I guess I can't sort of see all of the, all of the responses. Most are we getting any kind of response? No. From that? Oh, I think one person did a thumbs up. We have one thumbs okay. up here. Yeah. Okay. But a lot of times, sort of what a lot of times these kids learn to read on their own, which is great. Bill, the the, the phonics piece and the, at least the the the, the big in, intervention for reading is this is the science of reading is becoming very much into phonics and decoding. And I had this discussion with Dr. Silverman just as someone just mirror, I get off the dyslexia piece. Gifted kids learn differently. And I went, no kidding. Um, and it's sort of an interesting piece because. When I talk to parents about, well, what is your, does your child remember things from a long time ago? They go, oh my gosh, they have this uncanny memory. And yet they have this weak working memory. It's like being able to access the mem that memory when they need it, when they're being asked questions about how to do it. And they're overall, actually, I have anxiety here in the middle. Quite honestly, anxiety should be sort of the overall thing because they are big picture learners. They're going from, and if they have this big picture and they don't quite know how to be able to fit into that, anxiety sort of takes over everything. So when my child has difficulty, I use this, when I talk about pictures, I use this picture of if any of you as parents can relate to the child being frustrated. Um, I used to have a flyer that actually had this frustration as the parent about how so many parents came to me and said, oh, Mary, this is exactly how I feel. Ugh. How is it that I have this frustration with my child and I, they, they are so smart, but I can't get them to sit down to do something or I can't get them to focus. So that's, that's what we're seeing 
And really, then we call them these twice exceptional yeah. kids. So many of our gifted kids. Yes, Hassan, do I have a, is there a question? Um, our kids that are twice exceptional, they're highly gifted in some things. And then really what I wanted to be able to talk about more than anything, which I think was the question for so many parents was this executive function issue. And what does it mean? And why is it getting so much focus at the moment? Why is it hard for my child to be able to follow directions, especially in order, especially for gifted kids when they have a better idea? How can they control their impulse? How can they be focused? How can they be patient, attention, taking turns, and mostly being able to organize, organize themselves and getting, getting skills? So more than just plain talking about sort of the issues of the problem, Melissa had asked me a little bit about being able to have um, strategies more than anything as in what can we as parents do to be able to help our kids? And if that's where I want to go, Melissa, if that's okay with you about where and kinds of things that we can do. And I'd really love to be able to try and open this up to your discussion because it goes back to my very first question about as a parent, how we learn best compared to how our kids learn best and being very careful about imposing our way of learning on the way our kids actually learn because their learning experiences, here I'm sort of a whole different, two generations away from these kids and having to be able to learn. As parents, I get a lot of parents that will say to me, oh, my kid is just like me or my kid is not at all like me. And um, I used to think that the parent that was didn't learn at all like the way their kids learned were the most difficult to be able to try and have them understand. But I'm going to tell you that sometimes it's those of us parents that think like our kids do. And we, remember I said that we're really visual because I am this student. I am this visual spatial person. I am truly not a logical sequential learner. I am to this day not a logical sequential writer. I can still have to write out in longhand. The computers are really great help, but I need to be able to, like I'm sort of all over the place and then being able to put it together in some sort of order. It's like, oh, I have this idea and this idea. And it's really important that we learn that with our from our kids about what kind of learner they are and including them. You're going to hear me say this a lot in the next time we have together, we need to include them in problem solving about how to be able to help, how, what kind of help they need and what kind of help they want and work, work together. All right. So the very first strategy I'm going to tell you is to start with a positive mindset. If you are feeling like this parent I need you to take that into the other room and scream and do whatever you have to have, but I need you to be able to lose it when you're stopped and when you're starting to be able to work with your kids. Every night, if you're having homework, every night I need you to be able to have sort of a clean slate and start with a positive mindset about how things are gonna go. <sighs> Goals. Uh, how many of you heard this before? That, we, that these kids are just playing goal-oriented. And if you are working with someone that's a five or six year old and you're like, oh, I need to have this chart and I've had so many of them, or you're working with 10 to 12 year olds or you're working with high schoolers, you're like, oh, where have I heard this before? This is just so hard. I'm gonna tell you that, yes, it's, it's not easy, but being able to have a visual schedule for these kids and as much of us love to be able to have our electronics and love to be able to use the computer the calendars on our computers getting something that you write on is vital now there are lots of them and sometimes being able to have our kids be the ones that make them is really important the advent of the whiteboard is amazing it's awesome because it can change um, you see this one that I just happened to find, obviously, from a picture has different colors. Colors are really vital. So being able to start to be able, and, and I'm going to tell you that this, you know, started with a problem through the pandemic, even with my own adult kids are like, oh, 
mom, it's just so hard to be able to keep a visual schedule. And I went, and then they'd call the next day and go, oh my gosh, my world was completely different. And after about three days, they'd sort of lose it. But I have to tell you that be having a consistent structure is vital. What does this your school do? Right, Melissa, your school has a probably the kids have a specific structure that it is consistent. They know to count on it. So I get told all the time from parents, well, my, you know, my kid knows the week already. That's just real. I mean, I don't, you know, like, yeah, I have to be able to verbally remind them. I am going to tell you, get the, the bigger, the brighter, the bolder schedule. And this is not meant to be busy work for parents. This is meant to be an integrative activity, whether you choose a Sunday night or whether you choose a weekly Thursday, I don't care when you do this, but being able to have your kids be a part of what works best for them. And I'm going to tell you that it's not just about what their schedule is, but it's also about your schedule. I'm, you have a test on Friday. It is Tuesday. I'm not going to be here Thursday night. You need to start with what's going to be needed for Friday. Work backwards. No, I'm not going to be here on Thursday. So what can we do? Because how many of you have said, oh, it's Monday. You have a test on Friday and your kids are like, no, it's Friday. I mean, who care? It's, that could be a whole year away. Like they have no concept of time. Time, remember. Einstein and his <laughs> time commit continuum, they're it, as bright as they are, their concept of time is usually off. It's not a list they got put in the list, but being able to have this sort of visual piece for them is just really, really important. So if I sound like a broken record about creating this visual and being consistent, I apologize in the beginning, but not really try it. Have any of you had the experience of working with a visual schedule at home? And what's worked, what's not worked? Or any kind of discussion? All right. So I said, making sure that making sure that you include them in the conversation about what they uh credit, okay. I'm gonna go back to this again, sorry. I don't know how it is. Um, making sure that they are part of the solution. So this isn't something that, that, well, mom, you set this up or dad, this was important for you. You did this. That's not what this is about. This is about starting and, and you know, the younger you start, um, the more consistent they can be that, and then being able to have this available for them to be able to see. Um, Sometimes it's just about school. Sometimes it's really important. And especially if you have more than one child, being able to include who has what game where and sort of, yeah, well, I'm going to be here, but dad is not, or grandma might be here. Like being able to set this up so that, you know, you, this is going to change. So it's really nice that someone nicely made this structure that was theirs that works. I need you guys to be able to work up what, what works for them. And and be flexible with this, but using it within the confines of that. I can't I can't express enough about how important that really is. Okay. The next part of our research is um model what needs to be done. So well, I had one sort of question from parents before that was, how do I get my kid to be able to do a project? How oh, is it that they're supposed to I mean? How, the teachers have written directions or written examples of what it is. Honestly, these kids really need to see models. It is a whole lot easier than it used to be 20 years ago because now we all have Google or we have the internet to be able to look for visual models. But even if you help make a model, I know I've had this many a discussion with so many teachers that have said, well, if I show them what the model looks like, then they're all gonna make it like mine. Yeah, not these gifted kids. It's just a starter. And remember, they need to be able to see what the end result is like. So if you have a science fair project um, and it's really nice that everything is laid out about, you take notes, you make an outline. 
you know, it's great, but they need to be able to have the last piece first. And when they talk about the fact that we are whole to part, they need to be able to start at the very end, get the whole idea of the big picture, and then work backwards. And my guess is that most of your teachers sort of know this, but I am going to tell you that a lot of this work goes on at home and parents forget. So when your kids say, oh, you just, I'm supposed to, you know, the next, the next task is making note cards. Like, where does that fit into it? Remember I said they're pattern seekers? We need to be able to know how to be able to fit that into the big piece. So it goes back to that visual checklist again. So maybe you make a whole visual checklist for this particular project about what's needed because it's really important that kids know and then they get to be able to check off when that particular thing is done. But if they have an idea about what the, what the end is going to be able to look like, they can work they can work backwards a lot, a lot easier than they can to be able to just have one step at a time. Um, I just moved to a, a, a new town, a new place. And listen, I have to thank Google Maps for helping me. But I have to tell you, I had to go get a paper map so that I could at least see the big picture of the area to be able to get a sense. Because I then interpret that as I get a sense in my head about which way it is that I'm supposed to be able to go. It was a lot easier when I lived in Florida that I knew the ocean and I had a sense of where the ocean was directionally. And that guided me, even, even looking at a map. All right. So as I said, being calm, breathe, using humor, not sarcasm. I'm going to tell you, Still as a parent and now of adult kids, my husband and I are having this battle at the moment because I think we've gotten used to language of being very sarcastic and, and, and humorous. And for our gifted kids, it just, we need to, I'm just going to say we need to be really careful. Really careful. Using language, and especially if we have kids that are twice exceptional, that are a little more neurodivergent than, 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 they're not, they are picking up on tone of voice and picking up on look on your face and don't always get sarcasm. That can be something as a skill that you work on, but being able to work together as parents of using positive language, a language of what, of what you want kids to do. I was just on a webinar the other night talking to, and when they were talking about teaching kids reading and that word not is like a left brain kind of thing that doesn't always catch up. So if you tell your kids not to do something, don't not, don't, don't put your feet on the couch and they put their feet on the couch and you go, Johnny, I just told you not to put your feet on the couch. And the overwhelming picture in their head is what? Put their feet on the couch. Oh, right, that after the fact not is something that just is a second thought. Tell them what to do. Um, you know, I use the language all the time about, you know, when we all, <laughs> in the summertime, when, when lifeguards are yelling about don't run, what is it they're supposed to do? Giving them ideas about what is it that you want them to do to be able to use words and language to create a picture for them will go a long way. All right, one of the questions that came up beforehand was, how do I get my homework is a bit of a nightmare and being able to sort of put together this sort of four bit kind of thing, making sure your kids are fed, making sure that they have water, making sure that they have sleep. I mean, we could probably talk and probably have experts, but we could talk a whole lot about sort of video games and and electronic usage, um, that's a whole different ball game and it has a, but, but certainly plays into this, like get your kids to move. Um, I happen to be a part of an organization that actually assesses executive functions in kids. And they just came out with a new study that studied over 75,000 kids post pandemic and found that executive function skills, working memory, planning, flexibility of thought has, and, um, 
and and actually and and actually the movement piece have gone backwards and they're and it is and actually even with educators as well and it is vital to be able to get kids and people but up and running so the studies that prove that just 20 minutes of intentional movement will improve executive function we've known for a long time that an hour's worth of aerobic activity is much better than any ADHD medication anybody can ever give. Those studies are, are, are 20, 30 years old, so we know that. This 20 minutes of actual intentional movement, improving these executive functions is what's really important. So sometimes I know that it is, have your kids come home from school and get their homework done right away and then before practice, and I get that, but it goes again back to that schedule. Sometimes we need to break it up. Maybe we do 30 minutes of homework, go out and do some, go out and do some movement, do some intentional stuff. It doesn't even have to be sort of going for a 30 minute, 20, 30 minute run. It can be doing jumping jacks, it can be doing sit-ups, it can be doing what I call it, sort of cross midline exercises, jumping jacks. That used to be as, as a joke, that used to be my um, go to assessment for, for kids reading, whether they could cross the midline. And I will tell you, highly gifted kids have the hardest time with crossing, crossing their midline of doing jumping jacks, um, doing things about taking your right hand and down to your left knee and left hand and right knee. So that kind of thing is really important. The other piece about this, which is also really important is also meditational um, kinds of mindfulness techniques and learning to breathe when kids get frustrated going back to that anxious anxiety piece what do they do they take that deep breath in and then they hold it it's really hard to think it's really hard to come up with answers when they are not breathing so honestly taking a mindfulness there are lots of different ones my you know my favorite is Take a deep breath in to count to four. Hold it for the count of four. Breathe out for the count of four. And if you do that three times, try it between your third and fourth math problems that you're doing with kids. Doing certain breathing exercises, doing certain movement exercises is just really important. We need to explicitly teach our kids how to study. Oh, did you read it again? Did you highlight it? And how many of you have had the experience of having your kids highlight notes and the whole thing is highlighted? Everything's important to them. For a kid that's highly gifted, that's really visual, they're picturing the whole thing. They need to be able to think everything's important. So they need to be taught explicitly what is the most important kind of thing. And actually, I mean, then we've found that cramming, doing all of that, you know, if, 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 if you found that you were a crammer, you learned best when you crammed just before the test. Yeah. I love the fact that now we have, now we have studies that prove that that just doesn't work so well. And it really doesn't. And the challenge for our highly gifted kids is the higher grades you go, school was fairly easy. They could do these things. They learned it. They could remember it. They gave it back. They didn't really learn the inferencing piece of what that meant to be able to critically think about it. So when they are learning something, they need to actually really visualize experience at role play. You know, I'm a picture of a kid creating things in clay. I get it. Um, it seems like that might be early elementary, but you'd be amazed. I do that actually even with a program, the program I developed that I'm working with college and grad students and adults. That when you actually have to be able to manipulate something to be able to actually think about what something looks like or where it goes, it's amazing how your brain actually, your hands, you know, my, my grandfather was probably dyslexic, he had a creative builder. And I remember growing up and his, his, comp, whoops, his comments always were, I don't know how we lost that. Did I record it? What happened? How did I lose my... Right. Um, the work shows the way. So, you know, whether, whether you're role-playing 
um, create your having the kids, you know, instead of also a big one is the parents would say, oh, you know, I gave my kids the spelling words in carpool line or I gave them verbal verbal questions in carpool line while they were and they could they totally could retrieve it and gave it back to me verbally. Yeah, it's usually different than the way they're tested. So we need to be able to do things that make visual matching games. Flash, you know, flashcards are not not so wonderful unless you make doubles and the kids are playing their own sort of game. Use just plain memory games, whether you buy them or whether you make them themselves. But more than anything, mix it up. Don't do the same thing all the time because what do we hear from our kids? Hmm, it's boring. I've seen that before. I think I'm going to do that. So that's that's who I am. That's what we do. Those are some those are some ideas. I'd really love to be able to hear from parents questions about what they've tried. If there's anything about what I've said that you that you have for questions for me that we that we can talk out and sort out how to be able to help. This is my contact information. Please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, on my website, there is actually even a checklist of kids' strengths. Um, you're welcome to download it, look it over, see what you think. Um, it is, but see, I'm the one that looks at the strengths. It does look at strengths and challenges. So that's that's what that's what I do. So I'm gonna stop this for a minute and see if I can see who else is on and what we can, I think, what we can, what we can do about being able to chat with people, Melissa, can we do that? Yeah, there's a question in the chat right now that says, what advice would you give on how to handle emotional intensities? Oh, there's a, that's a really good question. So the emotional intensity piece is, um, it's certainly a, a hallmark of highly gifted kids. It's being able to try and catch them when they are not in that not in that mode. Um, sometimes, well, first of all, when they are in the emotional intensity, using less words, parents just have to stop, and they have to be quiet, and they have to be able to listen. And sometimes, um, just being there. If if that child has high, if that emotional intensity also includes sensory kinds of things. Sometimes wrapping a blanket around them or being able to help them have a help if they will let you let you hug them with no words. But the but the emotional piece is being able to then be there. And I guess I had this in one of the slides that I initially put on, but being there to be able to make sure that you are the listener your child will offload on. And using that as sort of a quiet accept moment, not necessarily the teachable moment about, well, if you had done this, this would have happened. They need to be validated. They need to be able to know that they, they're heard. So the emotional intensity is recognizing that they have intense feelings, using as few words as possible in response to that. Um, and recognize that, that that that's a good thing and then finding a time later on either after the fact that your child can offload about what they were feeling and why what triggers that and what kinds of things do that well mom when you say something like this that's what gets it. you know listen try not to be able to be compatible well but like <laughs> that's that's what it's like um, being able to try and um, we, we had um, our kids are really perceptive and they really want to be accepted. So it goes back to the tone of voice or their perception of their tone of voice. And we again, it goes back to explicitly teaching them that we actually have to be able to help them through those moments. Like if this happened to you again, what would you like me to do? Or what kinds of things do you need? Um, that makes it that that would help you in that respect. Because I think that parent that kids also have to understand that we can be emotional too, but it's you know, just telling them to to be able to control it, they don't know what that means, and it's impossible for them to be able to do. I don't know if that answers 
Um, um, okay, so one of the questions I guess that he is to convince the importance of priorities um, that he seems to have his own priorities. Okay, so inefficient time management. Yeah, that's kind of the name of the game for these kids. And, and that's why I guess it's a really good point. Um, depending on the age of the child, but this is sort of so, they actually have to be able to learn that. So being able to, like this sort of goes against when, and thanks for recognizing this, Philip. It's like his, your challenge about how you see the difference. Remember I said these kids are have have different sequencing and honestly, sequencing issues can be a really, a, a, a really big problem. So that when, so that, um, you know, again, sort of that very big picture, you know, understand whether that makes a big difference or not. If you do it in their order. Yeah. What would happen? And letting in sometimes that's a natural consequence of things because when they get through it and they go, oh, well, I guess you're right. If I'd done it this other way. Um, yeah. Trying to be able to have you stay calm and, you know, and sometimes again, you know, why is it that you know that that's a better way to be able to do it than he does or she does? You might, depending on what the project is, you might actually have them do it their way and see what happens. Um, honestly, hey, keep track of time. Like, you know, just for fun, we're just going to see how long it takes you to be able to do this. And then when you do it again and you do it the different way, we're going to take that, we're going to, we're going to keep track of time and let's just see what the difference is. Maybe they, um, maybe they will, maybe they'll recognize that. Oh yeah, you're right. Not, yeah. Yeah. That, that idea that you're right. Don't hold your breath, but <laughs> there is a chance that they will definitely, they need to be able, they, they need to be able to experience it. Quite honestly, their aha moments. That's probably the biggest thing I learned from these kids is that for them, the awareness, the self-awareness, all right, so now this is a really interesting question about how can you encourage your child to be more careful or meticulous? Man, I feel like I get the opposite question from from gifted from kids, parents of gifted kids that they're so meticulous and they're looking for perfectionism. Um, so the encouragement to helping your child be careful, first of all, I if this is looking for... Um, they work so fast and aren't are miss have make silly mistakes in math problems. Yeah, well, there are a couple of ways to be able to do that. It's like, well, if I find the mistake, we have two choices. You can either go through and find the mistake, or if I go through and find the mistake, there are going to be different consequences. Um, being able to try, I these are kids that they're notoriously don't want to write their work, show their work. Um, I will tell you from the very, you know, from the get go, if we can start them in first grade, being able to do this. So many of these kids want to be able to do all of that in their head. Why do I have to show it? Um, but being able to, um, right, it's exactly, it's everything is there. A lot of times you might have to be able to in encourage the teacher to make sure that they are Sometimes it's sometimes it's just having the teacher give extra points, for, like giving the points for showing the work or taking the points off for not showing the work. Um, I know, you know, my my daughter who has taught highly gifted kids for the last 10, 15 years, um, that's her biggest battle in here. She was like, I don't, you know, I don't want to hear from you guys. You have to show your work. That's just the way it is. Um, because a lot of times what will happen is that they will make a silly mistake on the second or third step. And if they, you know, add two plus three and get six, and they then use that number six to be able to go on and they did everything else right, well, you would have gotten the whole problem right if you actually had the right answer for five and you would have picked it up. So try, and, and a lot of times, be careful though, because a lot of times that being able to pick it up is actually a visual scanning skill, which is a whole nother challenge. And a lot of times our highly gifted kids actually have visual truly visual skills that are missing. Um, it's called convergent, having their eyes work together and being able to track evenly. So um, it's just really important 
to um and, and I guess I would I, I would engage your teacher to be able to try and help you with that one to be able to try and count points for and then I guess even at home having you have a re some sort of an, uh, a reward system to be able to if I find it this is what's going to happen and if you find it you get I don't know extra 10 minutes of doing something else so um how do you get your child to verbalize why they got emotional Hmm, that's a yeah well let's remember that a good share of this is being able to that they sometimes don't have the words to be able to express what they're feeling and we as as their parent or their educator have to be able to guess what's going on there it's it's very hard for them to be able to talk about it um and a it's easier to say, I don't know. Being able to be, it's trying It's trying to form a conversation in a circular sort of manner with these kids. You don't wanna be direct about why are you upset? Was there something I said? Was there something Miss so-and-so said to be able to make you upset? or that other kids were, being able to try and make it so that it's not directly about them, they really wanna please. And don't forget the picture in their head is, if I tell you that I'm hurting because, and they, they, they and this is when, by the way, this is when anxiety and depression for these kids is just really hard to pick up and really, really important to understand. And it's, there's at a young age to be able to have these kids be able to open up to you about anything. And sometimes they use the wrong words because the words, they they don't have words. You can see I'm even stammering, right? Because it's really hard to be able to put into words about how they're feeling. They're hurting and you can tell they're hurting. And sometimes the hug and an understanding about, you know, honey, I... I understand that you're really that you're really hurting and you're emotional. How can we make this not happen again? What do you think? What do you think it was that set you off? So you don't actually have to, and because the other piece of that, which is really important, is that you don't want them to you don't want them to relive the trauma. And it is true trauma because that trauma happens in the same part of their brain as if something is really happening again. So they can relive it as if it's happening again. And that's what we're trying to be able to avoid. So you're trying to be able to say to them, look, I want you, like, you know, when you were really happy, when we came back from the park, that's what I want you to be able to feel like, like flash back to them to positive kinds of things and how they were feeling and how can you help them get back to that same sort of feel. Oh. How can books or reads, are there anything that helps turn sarcasm? Well, there are some, but most of them actually have to be able to have, have to do with, I'm going to call it pragmatic language. It really is a language piece. And it is using, I mean, it is you having kids learn Tons having kids learn um, multiple, actually what we're really finding is that we're happy, having to actually explicitly teach high school kids multiple meaning words because they really don't understand um, that when you say certain things and that what that the differential in vocabulary and differential in meaning of words has a very different meaning. So the sarcasm piece, all I can say is for right now, it, it's partially practice, um, huge language issue. If they are truly having a sarcasm piece, uh, there, are, there are lots of articles and probably now lots of blogs about how to be able to help kids start to be able to do this. But I personally would try to avoid it as much as you can until they have a sense of themselves can laugh at themselves making language mistakes. Uh, it's, it's, 
it can be really harmful. And especially if these kids are emotional, I'm just going to tell you, just be really careful with it. That's kind of my, kind of my answer. I wanted to ask a question, Mira, about um, this comes up a lot with parents at our elementary campus, um, which are grades K to four, where parents are starting them out in lessons like piano or swimming, soccer, and the child just seems to lose interest like right away and doesn't want to go to it. And parents are struggling to know, OK, do we let them draw out? And then all of a sudden we're dropping out of everything and how we can help that because they just seem to quickly lose interest in all of it. Right. So any advice on that? That's a, well, that's a good, well, first of all, you know, there were, one of the positive pieces of the pandemic, if you can say that, was um, taking a pause, and taking a break, because I just noticed that parents were, like we were having our kids go everywhere and do everything. They were so overscheduled. On the other hand, it's a really important thing for, our kids to be able to have these outside opportunities in music and sport um, is probably it, it is so vitally important because they need to be able to have some sort of it, it's usually some sort of an outlet for them and especially since if they are academically talented and that's just sort of what they want to be able to we need to be able to have some sort of an outlet but. It also is a bit of a balance in finding the right instructor and the right group to be able to have. So, you know, I'm, I I grew up in a musical family. My father was a professional musician. So, so for me, I started to be able to take piano lessons when I was five. Um, and it's just so interesting because, you know, was I well, the one that didn't really want to practice as much? Sure, that visual kid. But it's really important to be able to it, have one thing and stick through it. But sometimes it needs being able to find a different teacher teaching the same kind of thing. So martial arts, like my 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 A number, you know, my my number one thing, my my top five list for things for kids to be able to do are martial arts and swimming. Um, depending on the age of the kids, it's in terms of sports, sometimes the team sports like. Baseball and soccer are, are hard because baseball is at eye hand coordination. So you need to be careful about, you know, we want all our five and six and seven year olds to start, but sometimes by the time they're eight or nine, they start to be able to weed out. But music, being able to try and have kids be able to be, um, to, to have music as part of it, as part of their life. I'm, that's my bias. I think it's just really important, but sometimes um, it's finding the right fit for the right person. I, you know, I'm a person that can certainly read music and play more by ear. And so for me, being able to have to learn all of the theory right then and there was just not so important. So a lot of times Suzuki, for instance, is happens to be a particularly really good thing for for young kids to be able to learn music. I think that for those of us that have, you know, want, it's important that the kids have that, again, we have a goal. It goes back to that goal piece, like, honey, you know, you're not, you know, you wanted to be able to learn to play the violin or wanted to be able to learn to play piano. I know you just want to be able to play, but set some sort of a time goal and have them be a part of that. Um, and not have it be one of, you know, five things that they're doing. Try, try and limit it to, you know, maybe one sport and one musical, one, one arts kinds of thing. Um, and, and try it for six months and see if by the end of that six, see if, if, if that, then we will reassess it and listen to why it is that they don't like it. And observe, is it that they don't like it? Is it, have they got, I mean, you know, that's a really, have they gotten to a certain age where all of a sudden the other kids around them are a lot better than they are? Maybe. We find that a lot with, we find that a lot with things like baseball and softball. Sometimes individual sports like golf or tennis um, are seemingly better because it's them setting a goal and getting better for themselves. 
sometimes it's really hard for these kids to be able to practice, by the way. Like, I just want to be good. I have this picture in my head about being this really great golfer and I'm just going to go out and hit it. Um, so again, it's that goal sort of goal and in working with whatever teacher or coach you have, be able to say, okay, you need to be able to appear in order to be able to do that. Again, working backwards, this is what you actually have to be able to do. That helps, but I, you know, not being really careful about over, um, oh, over programming these kids is really important. Um, I know that, you know, I hear this a lot from parents of gifted kids. It's like, oh, my kid's just going all the time. They need to be able to have, some kids need that. Some kids thrive on that. But a lot of times it's really important for, for them to be able to pick one or two things and zero in on that and then have them choose. Um, I am just going to tell you that, again, it, it it's it, these are not easy kids to parent. Okay, no, nope. parenting parenting is not for the faint of heart. So no matter what, but gifted kids. I mean, probably the challenge is let's remember gifted kids are still, you know, off that off that curve of what is so called neurotypical when everything is going is going on. So kids that have really strong learning disabilities and kids that are highly gifted. Like it's, you know, I think that the everybody thinks the other one is it's gee, it would be easier if. But the truth is, um, being able to encourage our kids to be able to be a part of who they want to be or what they want to do, they may not know. They really don't. And there are just so many things that are open to them that we didn't even know about five years ago, let alone 20 years ago. So being able to try and, and give them the opportunities. And having them be a part of the discussion is just really important. So, you know, unilaterally having them choosing what teacher they have or what program they're going to go to, I'm going to tell you is a, a recipe for disaster. Then you're going to get your emotionalities and you're going to get your behaviors and all of that. And one of the things that came up when, when talking about these executive functions, is remember that ability to think flexibly is a muscle that we need to help kids do. So when you're when you're constantly pushing to say no, you're going to keep doing this, that's just again, a recipe for it's all the way around. And more than anything, I'm I'm the educator and the parent that wants to be able to make sure that you're as the parent, you're the one your kids come to when they're having an issue. Thank, Thank you. You, so you guys are going to run. I got to run. I got to do this. Thank later. you so much, Mayor. It was great to have you. We're really thankful. And uh, hope if everyone they have questions, yep. Melissa, please don't hesitate to forward them, have them get a, get a hold of me. You know, things are different for younger kids versus older, but overall, yes, I know there's a lot of information. I get it. Yes, for <laughs> sure. Thanks about. again. Hope everyone Thanks has so a great night. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. Thank Thanks, you. you guys. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye.